Hey everyone, uh, I think we're ready to begin, so if you'd like to take your seats. Um, great to see everyone here. It, yeah, we're here to talk about the Chrome developer tools today. Uh, if you're here for something else, I think you should stay because it's going to be a really good session. Uh, my name is Sam Dutton. I'm a developer advocate for Google Chrome. I'm based in London. And I'm Pavel Feldman, software engineer working on Google Chrome. And uh, yeah, we're going to show you some great new features in the tools and, and hopefully some stuff that can uh, make your life easier as a developer. Um, you know, 2012 has just been an incredible year on the web. Uh, I was looking back at the uh, session that Pavel did with Paul Irish, who's in the house somewhere, um, last year. Paul, show up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it amazes me how much the Chrome tools have evolved in that time, how much the web has changed in that time. Uh, it just seems like the normal thing now for you guys to be building these apps that are, you know, incredibly complex and really pushing the limits of uh, development on the client side. And I, I think that one thing I've found is that in that context, you know, a really great text editor just isn't always enough. And, uh, you know, with that in mind, I think uh, that's where the uh, Chrome Dev tools come in. Um, so, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to run through some tools that uh, we hope will boost your productivity. And we'll also be looking in some detail at using the tools to do mobile web development. Uh, we'll also be looking at the idea, this idea of responsiveness. Um, you know, what is it? How do we measure it? And how do we deal with it in a scientific way rather than uh, with guesswork? And, you know, in a balance to that, uh, also looking at, uh, at memory and, you know, making sure that uh, we stay on top of that. And all through this, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a whole bunch of new features in the tools. Um, but first, um, I just, we just wanted to say, you know, a, I don't know, a really big tip of the hat to all the people who've contributed to the tools over the last year with bug reports, uh, feature requests, and, you know, by uh, committing code. Um, we've got a, a list here of some stuff, I mean, just, just touching the surface, of stuff that's been put into the tools in the last year just from user requests and user codes. Um, you know, fantastic contributions, really good stuff. Just to pick on one of these things, uh, you know, this business of caching. Uh, you know, caching is a good thing, but it can be a real pain for developers, uh, particularly when you're dealing with situations where assets are being loaded dynamically after the onload event. And, you know, in those situations, a hard reload or whatever just isn't enough. And so we've got two new features in the tools. From the network panel, you can right-click and clear the browser cache, or you can even just turn off caching from the settings page. So, yeah, great stuff, um, you know, from our users, and we're really grateful to that. So, uh, with that in mind, you know, we've got this room full of great developers. We thought we'd take this opportunity to try and uh, get from you guys um, some ideas about what you would like right here, right now, to see next in the tools. Um, you know, what, what challenges are you facing now? What would you like to see, Pavel? Right, guys, that's your only opportunity, unique opportunity, to request something, and without even filing a bug, I'll be implementing it for you. So please shout out <laughs> what do you want from the DevTools, and we'll type it in. We'll make sure it's not lost. Yeah, so come please. on. Okay, right here, right now. Shout it out. Just. Okay. Yes, please. Next one. Hey. More? Over here. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks very much. One here. Okay. And sorry, while we're on this side. What was that? That we already have. Yeah, just print, no, no, press let, like. Let me put uh, it in. I'll be happy to file yeah. the bug and close it. <laughs> Powerful will demonstrate. <laughs> Well, okay, blimey, we've got loads. Okay, no, no, down no, the front. Storing back in edited CSS. Okay, yeah. Edited CSS. Nice, nice. Yeah, and who else was down the front then? <laughs> Here. <laughs> uh, well, let's we'll see some of this. Yes. Uh -huh. 
I mean, we're running out of space. Okay, uh, maybe two more. <laughs> Like by the system, in other words, when like for sans serif or whatever, yeah. Okay, and behind you there. Bigger text or the development of the text? Ah, we can oh, help you with that. Better what? what? Bigger text. Bigger text. <laughs> and okay, right up the back. Ah, yes. Good, good. Right, okay. I think. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, that's a good list. Brilliant. I'm happy to say that at least half of it is already implemented. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's great. Okay, we'll take that so down. I'm and making sure it is not lost. I'll be filing those by myself and uh, probably will be implementing some of those personally. Yeah. And I'll be okay. following them around with a whip. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> so, you know, like one of the things, another thing we've noticed over the last, well, 12 months or so is that uh, people are using the tools now more for actually writing code, for building interfaces, you know, not just for debugging, and uh, you know, with that in mind, I mean, the DevTools team have, have built in some you know great features for for working in the tools in that way. And I was thinking about this, how to demonstrate it, this you know how this increases productivity. And I was thinking about the DevTools team themselves, you know, like the DevTools team build the DevTools to build the DevTools. So, and they you know they're good developers, they're really productive. So who better to ask about productivity than Pavel Feldman. I uh, thought it would be a good opportunity to give Pavel Feldman a chance to give us a master class. Show ah, us how he works. Now I feel flattered. Okay. Well, <laughs> before we jump into the demos, uh, let's, let me say a few words about the productivity. Uh, what do we expect from the tools for productivity? And for me, it is uh, getting into the source, into where I need to fast, and be it a part of the screen or action or a process. I'd like to jump instantly into the source code that is responsible for this action. And vice versa, while looking at the source, I'd like to know what it is responsible for. How do I get the part of the screen that it paints? While in the source code, I'm interested in changing it. And more importantly, I'm interested in seeing an immediate feedback. And uh, for those of you uh, who have seen the uh, Brett Victor's Inventing on Principle talk, have you seen that? Yeah, if, you don't, if you haven't, please make sure you check it out. That's an image from the Brett slide. So the main principle Brett is talking about is the instant feedback. And as he goes through his demos, it's clear that the instant feedback not only increases your productivity, makes you make, do things faster, but it also boosts your creativity. Because when things are uh, reflected fast, when you have an instant feedback, you start experimenting. You go through the states that you have otherwise not visit. Now that you have changed the source code and you've seen the feedback, the essential part of the tool is to persist it. So let me show you how these map into the DevTools features. I just started Chrome Canary, and uh, it is a version of Chrome uh, that is being updated on your machine daily. It is built from the tip of the tree sources of uh, WebKit and Chrome and contains all the features that are implemented by this date, including the DevTools ones. So if you are a web developer and you'd like to uh, make sure that everything works perfectly on the next version of Chrome, or if you'd like to use the tip of the tree DevTools, please use the Canary and please uh, provide us with uh, your feedback. But more importantly, Canary can run side by side with your Chrome browser. So you no longer need to choose whether you want to be on the dev channel or beta channel or stable to test your further changes. Just have those two installed and that would be very convenient. Oh, now I have no connectivity, sorry. It just plugged out. Hmm. So I'm navigating to the webkit.org and the uh, webkit is the project where most of the Chrome DevTools source code belongs. Uh, we develop DevTools front-end upstream. Let me reload it once again. Come on. <laughs> okay, let's go to the backup plan. <laughs> we have a backup plan. Don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the WebKit. And um, 
I'm going to do a lot of demos on the DevTools, and we're going to hack DevTools today. And after this session, you'll be able to contribute your source code into the DevTools yourself. Now, I'm going to debug this page. But before I, um, I'm not going to open the DevTools using the command option I. I'll do a different thing. I'm using remote debugging to start inspecting my page. And as you can see, remote debugging works as a regular DevTools. Now, as you can also see, this DevTools is opened as a web page. I can do that because developer tools uses client-server architecture where browser acts as a server and the front-end acts as a client. So the DevTools that you have in your browser is in fact a web app written in HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and it's talking to the backend using web sockets. Did you know that? <laughs> okay, good. Now I've been, uh, ooh. now it's, okay, is it okay? Now it's time to debug. And uh, as you can see, I opened the uh, DevTools doc to the right. And let me post the font a bit. Here you go. So what we are going to do here today is we are going to hack on the DevTools itself because I'm a DevTools engineer. I want to show you what I'm doing every day. So that's a regular stuff. There's your web page to the left. In my case, it's DevTools. And that's your DevTools to the right. <laughs> that so was we, life is so meta. <laughs> right, so we, we get a bit of inception here, so don't get confused. Okay, now I've been working lately on the uh, timeline uh, features. And as I was adding the timeline features, I noticed that timeline does not really look like the rest of the Chrome. We implemented in WebKit. We were using these colorful gradients, 3D looks. We don't really do that in Chrome. So I needed to fix it. And when you're working with the UI like that, you need to go back and forth between your page and the source code until what you see satisfies you. Let's try and recreate this experience right now. I'm recording a couple of timelines in here. And uh, if you can see those gray zebra bars in the central part of the timeline, let me make them a bit more conscious for you. To do that, I'm using the inspect element tool to locate the actual code responsible for the zebra bar. And in here, I can play around with its colors using the color picker. Let me increase its opacity and or maybe play with the color. And I can do it dynamically in here. I have a range of values I'm choosing between. And that's really a simplistic example of what Brad was talking about. Because as I go through these ranges, I was just going to bump the contrast a bit, but now I like the different color and I can accept it. Let's check if the sources were updated. And they were updated indeed. So that's my new color. Nice. But I think we have a bug, because the, in the top part of the screen, you can see the overview. It also has the zebra bar, but it was not updated. We are probably doing a bad job. We don't use constants here, or the style we are using is different. Let me do the same thing for the top area. So I inspect it. Whoa. That's not CSS. So it's not going to work like that. We all love CSS because it's declarative language. You change a value and you get an instant feedback. Everything updated live. Canvas is just JavaScript, imperative language, painting on a canvas. You can't go into the source code and change things dynamically, or can you? For that, let us try and find out what source code is responsible for this painting. Remember, we want to go from the screen into the source code. For that, I'm using command alt F, and I'm just going to search for canvas. And it searches through all my source project and uh, through entire project. And as you can see, we have a number of components that are using canvas. But I think the timeline overview pane is the one that I need. So I'm jumping to it. And uh, while we are here, let me say a few words about the new sources panel. So the sources panel is the one where you are dealing with your source code. You are going to view it there. You are going to modify it there. You're going to save it there. You're going to jump onto the source code from your UI. So you need more real estate for that. For that, we are 
we now have collapsible debugger sidebars and uh, expandable tree view with all of your sources. And remember, web scales, you need a lot of space for the list of your files. But you know what? You don't really need it at all times on your screen because you can hit Command O and jump to any file instantly. As I type, the list narrows down and I can jump onto a particular file or even a particular line number. Yeah, go on. Yeah. <laughs> now remember what were we doing? We were looking for Canvas, right? So let us search for Canvas. Uh, a lot of occurrences, does not work. Or uh, let us go through all the methods. I'm pressing Command Shift O and I get a list of all the functions in this file. And the same very thing will work for your selectors in the style sheet. And as I type, the list narrows down and I can jump to a particular function. But unfortunately, there is no clue on the canvas and the zebra stripes. So let's go on. But I think I have an idea. I think this code uses the same color that the CSS. Do you remember the color? What was the color there? What? 50% gray? Any more options? OK, so let's see if you're right. I'm pressing uh, Control. Uh, I'm, I'm using the context menu, Control click in my case. And I'm invoking local modifications. And I can see all the files that were edited within this editing session. <laughs> and let me search for the old color definition. Here you go. Uh, let me grab the new one. OK. Uh, I am using context menu, local modifications. We'll go there in a bit. Now, I'm replacing the code with a new value. And unlike in Brad's demos, unfortunately, screen is not updated. But the reason is that we are not using request animation frame to update our canvas painting. Uh, we update it upon resize or any event that is being painted in this hour view. Let us try and kick those modifications while resizing. Here we go. So what happened under the hood is the V8 driven live edit step in place. So when I save the file, the actual uh, machine code generated for that source file for that JavaScript was patched at a runtime. And any subsequent execution of that code was using the new code. Now let's see if the local modifications it's a context menu in here or in the scripts navigator to the left, captured our changes. And of course, they are here. Now let's see if we actually like them. I'm going to go ahead and apply original content for top and bottom areas. No, I like the new way more. Okay, I'm applying the revision content and I'm clicking the changes again. So as you can see, you can experiment with the revisions of your edited source files be it JavaScript or CSS. Now that we have edited all, um, we need to save it. And for that, we are going to use context menu and save as. Here you can bind your source file to the file system location, and all the subsequent saves are going to write to that location. Or you can do something more interesting. Uh, you can actually install an extension, Chrome extension, from the web store. Uh, I am using uh, Nikita Vasiliev's DevTools Aftersave for that. And uh, my extension is installed and configured so that it mapped the particular uh, URL into the particular location of my file system. And once I mapped it, everything else just happens automatically. Let's go and set ahead and see if uh, the changes are in place. And here they are. So the changes were indeed persisted in the file system, and I was not doing anything for that. OK, so now, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So now that's the uh, productivity story. We can jump into the source file. We can change it, see immediate feedback persisted. But it's really easy to uh, provide such an instant feedback when you are working on a desktop, because both your page and the DevTools are on the same screen in the same box. Wouldn't it be great if the same experience could exist while we were working for mobile? Sam? Well, yeah, the good news is that the DevTools are available now for mobile. 
Um, you know, the DevTools team have done a huge amount of work over the last year to implement remote debugging in WebKit. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really pleased to see this code being used across the industry now. Um, because there is no better way to uh, get a, a really good impression of what uh, your web app is actually like out in the wild than to do remote de debugging via USB on a real device that's getting real 2G, 3G, whatever connectivity. And uh, yeah, we'd like to show you that right now, actually. Yeah, let me check if we have internet connection. Yeah, we do. Good. We got internet? Yep. That's good. Okay, go on. Okay. So it's really easy to set up. Uh, if we go to the device, do uh, you need to log me in here? Okay, sure. Oh, I won't be showing it to you, sorry. <laughs> so on the device in Chrome, you need to go, you go to Settings, and from there, you can go okay. to... Wait, let me do it for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go to my, the right one there so you can see what I'm doing. So in Settings, you go to Developer Tools, and then make sure that... Uh, Enable web USB debugging is enabled. Uh, that's all you need to do on Chrome on the device. And um, now we've installed the Android SDK on desktop and then run uh, port forwarding, ADB port forwarding, so that now we can look at port 9223, which will show all the pages that are open on the mobile device. We'll just open up YouTube now. And you can see what's going on there. Yeah, there we go. And if we look, yeah, that's opened up. Great. So we've got dev tools there for the mobile device there. Right. Uh, and <laughs> okay. So now let's see how it works. Uh, of course, you can do simple stuff. So as I hover here, you get areas in the screen updated. <laughs> there you go. That's good. Or you can go vice versa, and Sam, could you yeah. click Tap on an on image something? here? Yeah. And here it is, the image that Sam has been clicking. You can see a feedback in here. But that's simple, right? You can uh, modify DOM here or play with the CSS, but that's all simple. You can do it with the other tools as well. But as Sam was uh, saying, you could do some interesting things with a mobile handset. Well, for example, let's go to the network. And while I'm on the network panel, I'm pressing Command R to reload the target page. It usually reloads the target page for the DevTools, but in this case, it reloaded the YouTube. And what you can see in here is the precise network information that with the DNS connecting, sending, waiting numbers for your cellular network for 2G, 3G, taken from the network stack from this very device. So that's the actual information in milliseconds came from this native network stack. And of course, you have all the other information, all the previews, responses, cookies, everything that is available in the DevTools, but against the mobile. Or let's say you want something more complex. You want to see how the cell phone performs on your tasks. So I'm reloading the YouTube again, and timeline shows me not only the network events, but also the style recalculation or JavaScript execution that happened on this very CPU architecture, different from my box. At this, at this very CPU clock, this headset is running. Or even more fun stuff. Let's do some uh, breakpoints in here. So I'm going to set a breakpoint. Oh, I have one on the mouse click. Could you click it again? Here we go. You stop it on the breakpoint in the cell phone. And all the regular DevTools features are available here. So I can pretty print. I can step through my execution and everything just works. So that's all the DevTools features, full-fledged developer tools running against the mobile. Fantastic stuff. Okay. I should take it from there. Yeah. That's fantastic stuff. So, yeah, we'll the, I guess, the Looking at the other side of this, uh, one thing we've learned after kind of 12 months of remote debugging is uh, that, of course, uh, in lots of situations, it's much the best thing to do to begin by doing as much work as you can you know, on the desktop tools. Um, but of course, for that, what you'd need is really accurate emulation tools. And the, the DevTools team have been working really hard on 
you know, putting a lot of those features into the, into the tools, which we'll show some of that stuff now, I think. So I'll go over here. So, we go over to YouTube. Let's open it over here. Okay, so we've got, yeah, we've got um, the desktop version there and the remote version over there. Now I'd like to go to the uh, settings in the developer tools and if I go in there and let's uh, go to the user agent panel there. You can see there's tabs now in the settings. And if I click on override user agent, uh, what's the, it's a, obviously a Galaxy Nexus. It's um, a Galaxy Nexus, yes. Yeah. Does so anyone have one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'll select that now, and uh, and let's uh, refresh that. And you can see we've got you know a really accurate representation of uh, what it actually looks like on the mobile device. And um, let's just, in fact, this little button here. I don't know if you can see that. There's, it kind of swaps from portrait to landscape mode. Pretty handy. So if I click that and then I just zoom out again. You can see now again we've got a really accurate representation, um, and and one thing we've got here is you know it's not kind of faking it. Um, you will be able to use media queries for this, and it, it will work. So yeah, really handy stuff. Now let me just turn that off. <laughs> and obviously another crucial feature when you're trying to uh, build for mobile devices is touch, and. Um, if we go to this example, uh, it uh, gives us a, you know, an ability to see how touch works. Uh, the only problem being, you should it do the doesn't override. Yeah, you yeah. left the override. Oh, sorry, I left the override on there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just refresh that, and uh, yeah. So what you can do here is use touch events, but you know it doesn't work obviously. Um, what we have in the tools is the ability now to emulate touch events, and you can set breakpoints and so on. And there we have it. Uh, I'm using touch there on the desktop device. So, yeah, really handy tools. So you were just dragging your mouse and it was emulating the touch event. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, that's good stuff. So, um, I'd like to just kind of, I don't know, shift focus a little bit now. Um, we've, we, we've talked a lot about the parts of the tools that make your life easier as a developer. Um, I was also, you know, thinking about uh, the, the users of your apps. What's in it for them? Um, and, you know, particularly in this world we have now where users really come to expect from web apps these, you know, these new features that really push the limits of the uh, CPU and GPU and memory and so on. And, you know, in that context, uh, in particular, how do, we, how do we measure responsiveness? You know, this idea, like, what is it, how do we measure it? Um, and uh, luckily, we have uh, some tools for that. I was thinking in particular, you know, a website you may have seen called HTML5 Rocks. Uh, it's got a really nice interface, uh, really great content. Um, but we'd, we'd noticed some, you know, just slight stuttering. It's hard to see here but some slight stuttering with uh, scrolling on the page. And, you know, the thing was coming at that problem, you know, there are a million things it could have been. And what I wanted to know from Pavel is how do we approach that problem where you really kind of have no idea where to start? So, yeah, I thought maybe you could give us some hints there. Yeah, of course. So you start with the timeline when you don't know what's happening in the page, and especially if you have performance issues in the page, you start with the timeline. So let us record a timeline in here. And I'll undock that tools to get a bit more real estate in here. And in the timeline, I am pressing record button. Then I go to the page and I scroll it a bit. And then I go back and turn off the recording. So what I can see here, let me zoom into a window here. What I can see here is a lot of events are happening within the browser. And timeline not only shows us the JavaScript events, it, all, it shows us all the native events, styles, painting, everything that happens in the browser. And while, while hovering over these elements, you can see what is actually taking time. Like yellow is scripting, blue is loading, we didn't have any, and green is painting. So this picture gives you a very good understanding of what's slow. Yeah, that's good, that's good. I mean, the only problem is, you know, I, I, mean, I remember when I first saw this timeline thing, I thought, wow, that's lots of information. But 
it's kind of useless, you know? It's uh, like, where do we go from there? Like, it doesn't really give me a picture of what's happening each time there's a slowness in the, okay, the yeah. render. I give up. So we've got exactly this feedback from you. And we thought we need something better. And uh, with this version of Chrome, we are introducing a new frame mode of the timeline. Let me zoom into a couple of frames. So with this frame mode in the timeline, we are defining a new term, a frame. And a frame is the amount of time that the browser needs to update the screen. It includes everything, JavaScript processing, recalculation of the styles, painting, everything is happening within the single frame, and then your user sees the picture. You can see the same nice color coding in here. Green is paint, and purple is uh, layout, and, uh, and styles, and the uh, yellow is scripting. But more importantly, we set a baseline to you. And this baseline is 60 hertz, 60 frames per second. That's what browser expects from you. You need to generate 60 frames each second. It gives you only 16 milliseconds per frame. That's the same vSync signal, uh, signal that we've been talking about on the keynote. Now, if we look at this very page, we can see that the frame was taking, in fact, 45 milliseconds. And it is above the baseline of the 60 frames per second, this solid line in the middle. So it's not JavaScript in your case. It's not styles. It's a paint. You must be painting something very beautiful. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. <laughs> what I know is the culprit is, yeah, there's some heavy-duty CSS in there. A lot of gradients. Uh, there's the um, oh. static. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like gradients. OK. Cool. Uh, sorry, I need to kill those. We've got those. like a nice static background image. And, no. Yeah. I know that's. I, I know it's nice, but it's slow. You know, I removed all of them, and the page still has that background. What's wrong? Okay, let's inspect. Oh, there are more. <laughs> and those are the same. You are using all over again the same <laughs> gradients. Twice as good. <laughs> okay, maybe it was making it slow. Okay, anyways, now that I disabled everything, and you can't really tell the difference, can you? Uh, let me go back to the timeline and start recording. And let me scroll here a bit. Go back and restart my timeline. Yeah. <laughs> this nice 16 milliseconds frame. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, uh, let's take it to the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, and if you want to learn more about that stuff uh, after us, there's the uh, Junk Buster session, which go into more detail. Right, so um, those are smooth animations. Wrapping up, please measure performance of your animations and scrolling. Now we have a good baseline, 16 milliseconds. You will know for sure battery smooth has now a value. It's 60. Use this time wisely. Think as game developers. Game developers don't have much time for a frame. Tools will help you narrowing down the problem, whether it's a paint or JavaScript. I've shown you the pain, paint events, and you needed to bisect those, regress, find where the culprit is. For the JavaScript, we have better tools. We will point you to the very line of the source code that is updating the layout or recalculating styles, so you will know what is wrong. And as Sam mentioned, uh, in this very room, right after hours, there is going to be an extended session on the frames mode for the timeline and uh, the GPU team from Chrome is going to drive it, so make sure you don't miss it. Yeah, no, great stuff. Um, of course, Pavel was kind of cheating there. You know, you can't always just delete stuff to make a web app work faster. Um, you can. We, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we all know that these situations, as much as you optimize everything, all your code, you get to a point sometimes where you've got some code that is just inherently CPU intensive, long running. And, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking about how to use the dev tools to deal with that. And I was thinking of, uh, you know, the pretty print function itself. Uh, what I've noticed with that is that, you know, it's obviously doing a lot of work, but it doesn't seem to freeze up the interface. So I asked Pavel about, you know, how that works. Right. So it does use more than 16 milliseconds of time. And we are using web workers to move the work up to, into the other thread. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I. I always feel like I should use web workers, but yeah. You know, Do you like, use web workers? Yeah. Not much, okay. I always feel, but I always sort of shy away from them because I feel like they're just hard to debug, you know? Like, where do you start? You know? 
Oh, is it? <laughs> uh, let's try it out. So as I mentioned, uh, we'll be focusing on the web workers. So let me go back to the um, page where we were debugging DevTools with the DevTools. And we'll be interested in the source code. Uh, do we have any? No, oh, let's reload. Let's get some. Yeah, we've got some files. OK, so here is the source code. And uh, as you probably know, when you press this little uh, button, uh, it gets pretty printed. Really nice. And as I mentioned, it happens in the worker. So let's try to go ahead and debug it. I'm going to the uh, debugger sidebar. And under the workers, tab, I choose to pause on start. So what it should do, when the worker is created for your page, it should stop it before the very first statement this worker executes. And we should be able to debug it. Let's try it out. OK. Now that we have three windows with the DevTools on the screen, I feel I must go over them again. So the one to the left is your web page. It's just me. I have the DevTools. Sorry. One to the right is the DevTools. And one in the middle is the DevTools for the worker. <laughs> now go let that. me step through that. Yeah, is it OK? Right, so I can step through the execution here, and you can see that I'm debugging the worker. The worker is stopped, but you can scroll the page. So the page is not uh, blocked by the worker. So this is not the fake worker emulation using iframes. This is a real stuff, native workers being debugged. Now, of course, you can use all of the debugging functions in here, or uh, you can go and um, collect CPU profiles, or take heap snapshots, do the timeline for the worker, or use console. And this DevTools window is working in the context of your worker. And if you type window in here, there is no window. And there's no document. Who are you? It is dedicated worker context. So this is, in fact, a worker object. Now we support debugging workers the dedicated workers and the shared workers. And the way to start debugging shared workers is to visit Chrome Inspect. That's where all the inspectable properties of Chrome are represented, be it page or an extension or a background page, application, shared worker, everything. You can start from here. You click Inspect, and you're brought to the right window. So that's the web worker story. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> I may even use them now. Um, we talked a lot about, about memory, but uh, of course, you know, there's always some kind of trade-off uh, with performance. Uh, well, or is there? Um, we, we did some testing of uh, Google Web Apps. And uh, you can see on the, uh, the graph here, the uh, yellow line at the top there represents over time memory consumption, uh, and the blue with a high level of variance represents a measure of uh, a perception of latency. Um, one thing we're finding with web apps, I think this is a really common experience now, is that you know, they're run, people are using web apps for much longer than they used to. We have users of Google Apps like running them for days. So you need to be aware of that, particularly in relation to memory usage. Um, what we learned was obviously that there were memory leaks and that we could fix. And uh, the most common source of that was problematic, in fact, was problematic usage of uh, event listeners. Yeah. OK, so I think we have some tools for that. Yeah, indeed. And uh, we are going to explore a simple example of the uh, memory leak. Um, so it's a lovely website. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to the source, and let us see the source code. So what it does is every time I click say hello, it creates an element, hello there. And it adds it to the result. But then in a second, it just removes them all. But they all are still here in this array. Let's see how the tool handles that memory leak case. But now let's imagine we don't know it all, and we start from scratch. Can you forget everything that I've just said? I'm uh, going to start recording the timeline and do a number of clicks in here. And let me undock the timeline. Oops. 
And uh, we are going to look at the memory view for it. And let me increase the window. What you can see here is the heap graph. That's the memory your app is consuming at the top. So it's a bit more than a megabyte. Then there is a regular timeline. And then there is the memory counters, DOM counters, and event listener counters represented in here. You can see that the number of DOM nodes increased from 18 to 24 as I was clicking. And the document is still alone, and there are two new event listeners in here. If I click on this step, I will see that there is an event associated with that. So every time it grows, there is some event in here. And this event is in, indeed the link, this link. And we can uh, hover over and jump to the line that was creating that object, of course. Um, but more importantly, we now know what user action is causing the leak. Now that we know what uh, is the problem, we'll find the actual location and the retainers of that leaked object. And for that, we turn to the profiler. And in the profiler, I'm going to, let me go back to the page, I'm going to take a heap snapshot. Let me say uh, hello a few more times and take another heap snapshot. And let's see what it is all about. So the heap snapshot is, in fact, the snapshot of the JavaScript heap of your running application. And the summary view uh, that I'm looking at is the summary for the heap, where all the objects are grouped by their type. For example, those are API functions, and those are date objects. Those are Chrome events. So everything is grouped in here. For each of the objects, I can see, for, for each of the group, I can see the object count, shallow size, and the retained size. So its own size and the size of the tree it is holding. Now, if I uh, go to the second snapshot that was taken after my actions that are supposed to leak, I can compare it to the first one. That's good. <laughs> and in the comparison mode, I can see that there are seven new objects. And if I hover over these objects, you get this uh, hover card that you got used to while debugging. And if I select this object, it will show me the retaining trees for this object. Those are the guys that reference my object. And those are the real cause of the memory leak. In this case, I have an array. And in its 13th slot, there is this paragraph element. And uh, you know this dollar zero that refers the currently selected element in the elements panel? It also works in here. Hmm. So from this panel, you can jump into the source, go into the console, into the running object, and explore it there. Let's see what is holding this array. It's a window. It's a global object. And the property name on it is holding. So if I do $0, that's my window. And if I do $0 holding, that's the array that was holding uh, the paragraph element. So to recap that, if you don't know where your memory leak is or where is the unbounded, unbounded cache that you're using, you should go to the timeline. Then you perform your actions and Look at the spikes in the DOM node counters. There is also a garbage collection button that you can press in the timeline to collect the garbage that should bring everything back to normal. If it doesn't, this means you have a leak. Now that you have tracked down the user scenario that is responsible for your leak, start using the heap profiler. You take a heap snapshot, then you do your action, you take another snapshot, and then you compare the two. And once you've seen the leaked objects, the objects that should not be there, look for suspicious classes. Uh, you own the code. You know it. Then track the retainers in the bottom part of the screen to track them to the global object. And you will see the exact path that is leaking memory. There are more complicated techniques for finding memory leaks uh, that are more efficient, uh, such as three snapshot uh, technology, where you take three snapshots, then you look at the third and filter out everything uh, that has been uh, allocated between one and two, or actually show everything that has been allocated between one and two, but it's uh, 
a different technique. It's more complex. It's uh, beyond this session, but uh, we are here at the Chrome booth, so if you have questions yeah. there, make sure you uh, come and ask them there. Okay. Thanks very much, Pavel. They're really useful tools for dealing with memory as well as performance. Um, we, we haven't got much more time, but uh, I just wanted to mention a couple more features uh, that have come into the tools now, really useful stuff, particularly in relation to client-side storage. So It's not the end. Have a look it's at the features for IndexedDB and AppCache. Uh, if you've seen the Web Components talk, we've got great tools for Shadow DOM inspection. Just go to the Elements panel and uh, drill down into an element, and you'll see the Shadow DOM components. It's great stuff. Uh, my favorite thing of all, though, that Pavel wouldn't let me demonstrate, um, <laughs> is source maps. Th these are really easy to work with. You know, you use a tool like Clojure to minify your code. At the same time, you make a source map file. You put a link to the source map file in the minified code, and that's it. When you use that code in the, in the dev tools, you'll see the human readable version seamlessly in place. Ah, and it makes life much on, easier for debugging. Yeah. How can you love a feature like that? Here's my <laughs> favorite one. Wait, let me hijack it a bit. So there's, um, there was this uh, web kit, right? Let us go back there. Or no, let's, let's do Google. OK. Yeah, yeah. So in the dev tools, right, I'm a developer, and uh, there's everything in here. OK, and that's Google. And uh, sometimes I have ambitious, and I kind of think, OK, let me change things here. And it'll be not Google search. It's Google super search. <laughs> or uh, no, it didn't apply. Why? No, they are fooling me. Come on. <laughs> Do it again. That's weird. Yeah. Oh, that was a title. OK, sorry. I'm feeling very lucky. Are you working for me here? OK, good. And then I have more ambitious, I think. OK, so that color is not the same. I want a red one. And then I think, OK, uh, this Nexus 7 is really cool. Um, let me actually go and boost the font size for it and do the shift up. Yeah. Then I think, OK, so there's enough, enough clutter here, right? I need to get rid of it and go and delete it all. And you know what? The search field, I don't like it either. I'll just delete it all. And it's too complex. Yeah, come on. And then I think, OK, I've done a lot. Why, why can't I delete it? Come on, Google, where is it? Yeah. And I think, OK, that's <laughs> enough. And then I calm down, and I think, I like it the way it was. And I press <laughs> Command Z, and the things are undone. Really? Or I press Shift Command Z, and the things are redone. So we have the uh, complete undo redo stack in here uh, that is more importantly retaining the identity of the nodes. So when I'm deleting nodes or recreating nodes, those are the same objects. And your JavaScript points there, and your program remains functional with that. So that's a cool feature. That's great. Right. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Go back, go back. <laughs> Come on, while you're, while you're there, that, someone asked for this. Do commands, what's it, command plus. OK, yeah. No, I won't be showing. Come on. What? I'll show ah. you the question mark. So the question mark is where you get all the shortcuts to all the features that we have, that the ones with the shortcuts, including the ones that go to file, go to line, and, and boost your font size. OK. okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, we've, we've, been using, we've been using Chrome Canary today. Uh, would recommend, you know, if you're using the dev tools a lot, that uh, you give Chrome Canary a try, you get all the newest features, and also you can give us feedback uh, on how you'd like to uh, see the dev tools in the future. Um, and if you've never filed a bug, you know, today's the day. Don't be shy. New.crbug.com. Go there to file bugs, make feature requests, anything Chrome related, particularly with the dev tools. Do it now. So yeah, that's the place to go for any of your stuff. So yeah, that's it from us. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Um, questions? We've got about, yeah, about uh, seven minutes for questions. So if you'd like to ask questions, come up to the mics in the aisle there. I thought of one more request when you're taking a request for improvements to DevTools. Remote debugging is really cool, but it doesn't work when you're offline because it hits AppSpot first, which okay. makes it really hard to do like mobile development on an airplane. So I can give you an advice how to work around it, <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll fix it. So the workaround is to save 
that page that is served off the app engine. And it's just a web app. And you save it, you open it, and you point to your Chrome uh, instance or your mobile instance, and it'll work. OK. No Thanks. need for a cloud there. Okay. Is there a way to see the packets in my web socket? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you can see the packets on the web socket. And uh, let me show it to you. So that's uh, OK. So I'm, I'm going to use a, we are using those, right, for the, for the dev tools itself. Where are you? No, where are you? OK, so um, I'll need to do dev tools on dev tools on dev tools, but that's probably fine. You got used to it. And uh, in the network, uh, no, I don't really need to record. I'll just do some stuff. And you should see the packets in here. And if you aren't, we just can't find them. So the idea is that you can see uh, the resource responsible for the WebSocket packet in here. And uh, in the uh, editing part of the screen, you will see uh, WebSocket Frames tab. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you right now. But it's there. And uh, it is going to be stable in Chrome 21. It's a recent feature. Yeah, cool. And another. Hi, thank you guys for the presentation. It was really cool. So I have a question. Is it possible to simulate the HTTP request like that made from UI or you know, you click a button, you have a bunch of uh, requests. Is it possible to simulate a bunch of them and override some headers or write a script that can do it? Not yet. H XHR replay and simulation is uh, very high in our to-do list. Yeah. So we are going to make it soon, but it's not there yet. Yeah, lots of people are asking. Right. Thanks. So do these techniques, I mean, the kind of examples that you showed were a little bit you know, contrived, obviously, for the demo. Um, but let's say Gmail. <laughs> Does Gmail use the Chrome dev tools in the same way that you're doing it? Or do they use different tools? Or do they have different techniques in how they use the tools you know, for um, debugging and just working with that system? Because there's literally you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of events happening per second in the timeline. The heap snapshots will have you know, tons of different things. So does it scale to something at that level? Gmail is our best in-house client. So we are working with them a lot. Uh, these uh, three snapshot techniques with the heap profiling was in fact, uh, those were discovered while working with the Gmail team uh, while they were uh, hunting the memory leaks. They are also using timeline and of course they are using our debugger. Okay, so it does yes. scale yes, to that level. Okay, of course. Yeah, that okay, thanks. Hi, uh, is there a good way to inspect, edit um, CSS keyframes, the, the CSS animation keyframes? Because you can, you can uh, see the defined animation, but I want to see the keyframes, edit them, and then uh, look at performance issues. So the best you can get is uh, just jumping to the source code and editing them there. Uh, everything you, de you do in the source code is immediately reflected in the screen. Okay. But okay. there is no structural editing for the keyframes and for media queries yet. Okay, and then is there a way to trigger them to force them to rerun in a performance tracing kind of context? Of course, you can edit everything in here and then you just save and then you go to the timeline and you perform those actions and they will be using these new styles. Okay, thank you. That's awesome stuff. Um, is the mobile remote deb debugging going to be available on Chrome for iOS? Uh, I uh, don't know. Okay. We'll need to check. So the remote debugging uh, backend is a part of WebKit. So the code is there. Um, I believe there is a, a way to remotely debug uh, iOS devices. Uh, I don't know about the Chrome OS, but I can find it out for you. And okay. That'd give be awesome. me the email, and I'll send right. it back to you. Thanks. In your talk earlier about getting below 60 frames a second, there was, I think, green, purple, and blue that were colors that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And when you got below, they all turned gray. What was the gray for? OK, yeah. So here's the thing. The frame for us uh, is uh, everything between beginning of the frames. And the gray uh, that you saw above is the CPU activity that we do not instrument, uh, or it's an idle time. We are working on distinguishing between the two. So very soon we will be able to say, this is the CPU. It has been doing something. 
or this is idle, the other tasks are using it. So we are actively working on the timeline uh, on the frame mode, and it's a very first revision of it. So if it's gray and it is the CPU that's doing it, it's your app that's causing that CPU to spin up, but you don't know why? Right. This, the spikes that we saw on the timeline, the gray one, transparent one, were related to the CPU load, related to the switching between the windows that I was doing as the timeline was captured. So that was idle from your page perspective, because it was not wasting CPU resources. So we'll be able to cut that down soon and tell you that your page is not responsible for it. But the picture that we show is accurate uh, from the repaint perspective, from the, pain, uh, from the frame perspective, because something has been happening, and your frame has not been painted at that time. So there was indeed a junk in the repaint. OK, thank you. Okay. Is there any plans on integrating a uh, like a testing framework into the uh, dev tools? So say macros and assertions and, and these kinds of things. So we have a, a nice extensions API support uh, where we add extensions for for you to be able to build your own panel in the dev tools, or uh, to react upon selection of an element in the elements panel and such. Uh, we might extend those APIs if they are not sufficient for achieving your goals. Uh, so we, yeah, we are uh, we're relying upon the third parties to provide the functionality like that. Okay, so there's no, right now on that direct like roadmap, there's no plans for a testing framework, essentially. Right, those would be done through the extensions at least at the first phase. Okay, cool, thanks. Hi, I'm an engineer on the Google Plus team. And first of all, I just wanna say thanks so much to these tools. I couldn't do my job without them. I mean, they're, they're just a real joy to use and they make web Thank development you. fun again. Um, that said, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, do, we do obviously have a pretty massively large JavaScript application uh, and it, you know, it's compiling the files together and it's sharding them across and all that. And so um, at least the search across sources made it easier again to figure out where that JavaScript is coming from. But just loading it in and parsing it and printing, printing and all that still is pretty pokey. It's many you know, that we're waiting a while. I'm just curious how optimized that stuff is and how much you think you can improve the performance even further for when you have really large JavaScript? Right, so uh, by the moment, Gmail was our like, uh, largest client. So whenever they hit uh, the limitation, they kicked us and we fixed it. And please do that as well. <laughs> and we'll be improving. So right now, uh, with the frame mode, we found that we have a lot of junk in our own UI. And we do know a couple of bottlenecks uh, related to the uh, scale with our text viewer. Uh, we are comfortable at about 100K lines. Uh, when it goes beyond, we are not that comfortable from the memory standpoint, but those are all fixable. So as we hit new limitations, we are fixing them. So please provide your feedback. Okay, great, will do, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Question from this side. Yes. Um, we've been writing some code that runs on both Node.js and the client. It shifts it back and forth. Um, and since Node.js uses V8, does it have any association with this? Or is this purely the client-side browser? So we, right, uh, this is working against uh, the WebKit-based browsers primarily. So it does not work against V8 or Node. Uh, there is a solution that works against Node because Node supports, exposes the V8 debugging protocol. Uh, there is a project called uh, Chrome DevTools for Java mm. that is uh, an Eclipse plugin, an Eclipse SDK that can connect both to Chrome and to raw V8, including Node. I know that there is a uh, fork of Web Inspector that work the, the old, pretty old front end that works against Node. And uh, I know that there are people that are trying to uh, implement wrappers around V8 so that they emulated the remote debugging protocol that Chrome DevTools is using so that we could connect there. But that is a work in progress. Okay. So it's Chrome DevTools for Java, and that's an Eclipse plugin. Cool, thanks. Okay. Um, Thanks very much. I think we'd better wrap it up there because yep. we've run out of time. But thanks again, and thanks also Thank for the live uh, feature requests earlier. We'll take okay. note of those. Thank you. Thank you.